um, yeah, so hi, um, <clears throat> I'm Upman Ulal at Columbia University, and uh, thanks for inviting me to come and present on your Global Water Futures program. Uh, today, I'm, I want to talk a bit about uh, climate dynamics as it affects hydrological extremes. And what I'm going to focus on is patterns that emerge in space and time and their implications uh, for hydrological fluxes, obviously, but also more importantly for how systems are managed. So I'm going to walk you through a set of examples uh, and collectively the intention is to make the point that there is substantial organization at the planetary scale in the way hydrology is organized and um, that there's potential predictability in those However, our current physics-based modeling systems are not particularly effective at unraveling this. So this is a set of open questions that are exciting and interesting to know and learn about. So that's the spirit in which um, we'll walk through a set of examples. So let me go ahead and start and expose you to the basic idea. So as I said, the key points are that there is substantial organization of global hydrological fluxes in space and time. And one way to think about the story is that water emerges as a tracer for the climate system to understand, diagnose, and predict what is going on in climate. In the same way that if you did Lagrangian transport of contaminants in water bodies, you would understand what the associated organization of the velocity fields was. Uh, that's the role that water essentially plays in the climate system. And it's the opposite of what most people do, which is they'll take outputs from climate models as to water and then just go ahead and apply them to hydrologic models. Here, I'm arguing the opposite. I'm saying that the water fluxes through the planet play an important role in actually understanding the climate system because that's they, they speak to the nature of organization that emerges uh, in the climate system, and hence, in that sense, represent emergent space-time patterns. And in particular, if I look at extremes, uh, extreme floods, extreme droughts that traditionally hydrologists have thought of as random events, uh, and we have modeled them statistically as random processes, um, they actually emerge really as an outcome of these organized patterns and they require a very high degree of organization of the global climate fluxes to emerge. So in that sense, I think they are very interesting objects to try to understand rather than thinking of them as some random stuff that is happening somewhere. So the approach that I've been using in my work is to use data science tools in conjunction with physics-based models. And the intention is to then use these things together to explore global, regional, and local predictability of hydrological extremes. And the, the end point of the story, or what we have learned is that the larger scales of climate variability determine the spatial temporal linkages. So if you are at any particular land location on the planet, to understand why, this, why something extreme happens there, the answer lies in how the larger scale climate organizes itself. So let's go through and uh, look at this journey from global to local scales with the goal of understanding and predicting the risk profile of extremes uh, that we are interested in. So first I'll start with the global scale and we will look at some examples of the nature of global hydroclimatic risk as it impacts society. So this is to motivate that these things actually matter for social outcomes. So we'll start there. And what I'm going to do is show you some examples of some moderate extreme events, things that happen on average uh, once in 10 years globally, and what's the nature of their impact on society collectively across the world. The second question I'll look at is, is there a temporal and spatial structure in extreme floods and precipitation, which frankly was implied by the first example. So we look at two specific variables, the duration of floods, which is not something most people have focused on. They focus on the peak flow and the contiguous area associated with extreme rainfall. Are there structures or patterns associated with those? 
And the third question is going to be, can some aspects of the linkages between global sea surface temperatures, atmospheric pressure, and precipitation be identified and used for near-term prediction? So the idea here is the same as in the application of physics-based models for near-term to medium-term forecasting, which is that the sea surface temperatures evolve relatively slowly. And as a result, they, pro they provide a boundary condition for the atmospheric circulations, uh, which in our case here in this example is signified by the atmospheric pressure fields, which are a surrogate for how winds develop and other things happen. And uh, as a result, precipitation emerges. And here, uh, in the climate context, most people have started focusing on climate change impacts on precipitation. Namely, as things warm more, the atmosphere holds more water. And uh, since the hydrological cycle is a cycle, that then suggests that the increased storage of water vapor in the atmosphere could also lead to increased uh, rainfall amounts or rainfall intensities as a result. But one part of that story that is not looked at nearly as much, but is actually more important, I think, is the role of circulation. So if the circulation becomes more organized and stronger, then it, that means that more water would be moved from the equatorial regions where most of the evaporation occurs to the subtropics and extratropics. Uh, or if the circulation becomes weaker, then we have less predictability and we have weaker patterns that emerge. So the, the role of the circulation in changing precipitation, I'm arguing is at least as important as the role of warming in changing the precipitation characteristics. So in this particular case, I will offer an example that looks at a lead lag correlation network between sea surface temperature and sea level pressure uh, at the planetary scale. So that defines empirically how the boundary conditions of sea surface temperature impact near-term pressure fields and winds, and then how those can be used to predict near-term extreme rainfall over the planet. So these are the three examples I'll develop in the first segment. So let's get started. So the first example here, what we did was that we took this data set on reconstructed uh, SPEI, which is precipitation minus evaporation, that uh, has been produced from uh, using reanalysis, climate reanalysis models for the years 1900 to 2015. This is at a daily resolution. And so from that, what we do is that for each year at each location, we identify the annual maximum rainfall and the annual minimum rainfall, or actually to be accurate about it, annual maximum P minus E and the annual minimum P minus E for the day. Uh, or for different windows. So in this case, what we the picture that I'm showing you is for a 12-month window, and we take the 10-year return period event associated with that uh, at each grid box globally, and this data is gridded at a two-degree resolution. Uh, and so what we do then is that we go back and look historically and see how many locations in the same year across the world had an exceedance of this 10 year event uh, empirically. And then uh, at each location that had an exceedance, we look at the production of specific things or things that could be impacted. So for example, we could look at copper mining and look at total copper production in that grid box because of mining and similarly for gold. And then we can add up the overall global production that could have been impacted in that year by one of these extreme events. And we normalize that by the total global production uh, on average. Uh, and so what is shown on the x-axis of these plots is the fraction of global production or population that was affected in that particular year by a 10-year return period event. So what you see is, that interestingly, there's quite a bit of fluctuation year to year, but the trends for copper and gold production overwhelm the, the trends for uh, urban population exposed and uh, total and the main crops uh, that are being produced uh, and their impacts. Now, that's interesting because in 2008 or so, there was a big story uh, in terms of rice and wheat prices exploding because of. Uh, moderate droughts in India, Australia, Thailand, and China, which had a significant impact on global prices. But
But if you look here, which is uh, the crop production is the red curve, there is some hint of an impact in 2008 or so. But overall, the amplitude of fluctuations associated with crop production is insignificant compared to copper and gold. Now, clearly, the difference here is that copper and gold are not perishable commodities, but they are critically needed for the renewable energy boom that we are basically pricing in. So to see a big impact there could have a significant impact on global prices and depress the renewable energy boom. So that's kind of the message that we get out of this. And we actually see that the blue curve, which is the urban population drought impacts globally, is also about on par with the crop production story. But the trends in both of those are somewhat downwards. So if we are concerned about the climate change impacts on crops and urban populations, this suggests that overall, uh, the trend is not really one uh, on, on a global average that is increasing. Whereas on copper and gold, it's interesting that this is not a monotonic trend, it goes up. And then and recently, the, the frequency of those extremes has actually been coming down in those geographies. So let's take a bit of a bigger look on copper and gold, because that's interesting to explore since they were the biggest amplitude. So here we have taken two companies, the two major companies that are copper producers, Rio Tinto and BHP Billiton. Rio Tinto has 40 mines, and those are shown in the map on the top left. And BHP Billiton has 38 mines, and those are shown on the map in the top center. And then on the left bottom, we look at how many of those mines for Rio Tinto had an exceedance of the 30-day, 10-year return period rainfall in the same year. And so that's plotted below in the dots. And what's interesting is that the worst case was 36 of the 40 mines that Rio Tinto owns uh, ended up with an exceedance out, uh, in the same year out of, uh, so this happens once in 142 years. So if you calculate the probability of that happening, if all of these were random events, that probability is somewhere around 10 to the minus 29. So basically, it says that these could not have happened randomly. So there's some kind of a phenomena that leads to a spatial clustering of these kind of impacts. And you can see that there are also, there's another year with uh, 32 of the mines being impacted and another year with about 25 of the mines being impacted. What's in common is that these all happen to be years in which El Nino events happen. So interestingly, these geographies where this, this kind of mining is happening are susceptible to El Nino activity. And that is the uh, phenomena that is providing the organization associated with this. Similarly, for BHP Billiton, the, we look on the drought side rather than on the wet side, and this is a 10-year drought. And so in the BHP case, out of the 38 mines, in the worst case, they have 24 that have, uh, have this kind of event happen uh, in the same year. This is a more recent record. So this is only 60 years of data, whereas in the wet side, we looked at 142 years of data. So the probability of something like this happening is 10 to the power of minus 19, same point. So basically, in both of these cases, we have strong evidence that there is quite a bit of uh, clustering in terms of the impact of extremes that happens at the planetary scale. And that explains what we were seeing in the previous graphic. Uh, but here, since this is the context of specific companies, we can see that in terms of a climate risk disclosure, these two companies should be disclosing that they have fairly significant disclosure to climate risk which they may or may not have uh, managed adequately, perhaps through insurance. But in that case, the risk transfers to the insurance company and they would need to disclose that they face this kind of a risk. Okay, so second example, uh, this is motivated by looking at some data collected by the Dartmouth Flood Observatory that became the Colorado Flood Observatory once the principals who started that at Dartmouth moved to Colorado. And basically what these guys do is that they use satellite imagery and news media uh, reports to identify flooded areas from satellites. Uh, and so they have this data that continues today. And when I did this work, that was in 2014. So we had data from 1985 to 2013. Now, keep in mind that this, there is a clear censoring of the flood process by this kind of a mechanism, because first of all, 
the flood has to last long enough that the satellite visit detects it. And the second thing, uh, repeat satellite visits detected, for example. And the second thing is that satellites, uh, at least over the period that's reported here, were uh, did not have sensors that were cloud penetrating. So basically all kinds of flash flooding events or short duration floods are automatically screened out. So what's interesting is to see, to recognize that and then think about the longer duration floods and uh, that are represented by this kind of data set and what kind of organization do we see in that? So here I have colored uh, flood events that were in their database at that time, about 4,000 events, and how many of them are of different durations, under 15 days, uh, greater than 15 days, greater than 30 days, greater than 60 days, and greater than 90 days, for example. And you can imagine that a place that is flooded for over 90 days, uh, there is a significant social impact that comes with that as compared to something that has a one-day flooding event, which may be catastrophic, but uh, the impact doesn't continue and hence the economic uh, carryover effects are somewhat limited. So what's interesting here is that, you know, about 20% of the events have a duration longer than uh, uh, 15 days. And uh, then there are still around 30 events out of 4,000, so around 1% that have uh, these 90 day durations. So one of the, we did several exploratory analyses with these, but the thing that I'm going to focus on here is we find that there is an interesting relationship between the log of the flood duration and the log of the number of floods with that duration. And this is uh, one of those classical uh, fractal scaling relationships with a scaling exponent of uh, negative two, which basically says that as you increase the duration of the floods, the rate at which, or the exponential rate at which the number of events drop is given by this exponent out here of two. Uh, and there's quite a bit of organization around that. Obviously there's scatter around that as well, particularly as you get to the longer duration floods. So, but these kind of relationships have been postulated and demonstrated typically with long memory processes in time and with uh, turbulence uh, driven processes in space. And so it's interesting that this data set reflects that kind of an organization at the planetary scale as well. So that was sort of curious. Um, obviously, there were issues with that particular data set because it does not, it, it censors the shorter duration events. So we were interested in seeing if this would hold up if we used a physics based model to generate the floods as well. So this was work with Philip Ward, who used this model called PCR GlobWeb to generate floods globally. And uh, so, so the same analysis is done here and repeated. Uh, out of band flooding durations are computed based on that model. And then uh, the plot of log number of events versus log durations is done. And we find that uh, interestingly here, the slope is uh, around 1.8 rather than two. So similar, uh, but here we have included some of these uh, shorter duration events. Uh, in the plot, which uh, depress the slope to a certain degree uh, coming out into this thing. So, uh, and if you censor those, it's back to around a minus two slope. So we were also interested in whether La Nina or El Nino events play a role in this. And uh, what we see here that's interesting is that they do, but they shift the intercept. So the number of events that happen in La Nina versus El Nino versus neutral conditions uh, is a little bit different. So in the La Nina and El Nino, we get fewer uh, number of events overall uh, relative to when we look at the neutral events, but uh, the exponents in terms of the organization of the duration of flooding is very similar. So that's rather curious. And we have wondered uh, what could be the processes that lead to the kind of storms that generate these long duration floods. and more on that later when we get into the regional scales. Uh, and we will see that what basically characterizes those kind of events is repeated waves of moisture coming in and continuing to inundate the area in question. Okay, so that was uh, one example at the global scale uh, with flood durations. The other example that I wanted to highlight 
is uh, that on spatial structure of precipitation extremes. Because one of the complementarity hypotheses that are ex explored in scaling and in turbulence analyses is there a complementarity of space and time. So if we have a long duration event, is there also a larger spatial scale associated with it? And the answer typically is yes, that there is that sort of complementarity in space and time organization that results. So we were interested in seeing what happens here in terms of spatial precipitation organization. So to do that, uh, we use this so-called she Arcid database, which is a global rainfall data, uh, which is blended from uh, station data and from other sources of data, such as satellites and radar. And this data set, when, the, when this analysis was done, was from 1979 to 2012, and it's gridded at a resolution of 0.5 to 0.5 degrees. So what we did was that at every grid in, in the whole world, a uh, half degree by half degree grid, we calculated uh, one day, 10 day, and 30 day rainfall amounts, continuous one day, 10 day, and 30 day rainfall amounts at uh, each grid. We calculated the annual maximum of those uh, values. So for example, if you're looking at 10 day, we would do January 1 through January 10, January 2 through January 11, 3 through 12, et cetera. And then you, from all of those calculations, you take the annual maximum and record that as the target value. And once you have that, uh, you go back and then you uh, calculate the uh, 95th percentile of those annual maxima for each one of those durations. And then you go back and calculate how many locations experienced an exceedance of that in a given year. And then when there's an exceedance, calculate the contiguous area associated with that exceedance. So if you look at the bottom left picture, what we see is that the contiguous area that was represented there is marked by ones. Those three boxes are contiguous and they had an exceedance of the 95th percentile in the same time. And then there is another box that had it, but it's not contiguous. So we would calculate, uh, we would record one box with a one day rainfall event that was contiguous and one box with uh, three boxes as the area associated with the contiguous rainfall for that particular year. Similarly, if you look at the bottom right, this is a 30 day rainfall. And typically we see that when you are looking at longer duration, there's more spatial contiguity to some extent. So in this case, we end up with one area, which is five boxes and one area, which is two boxes. So, the, so that's the data set that we then subsequently analyze. And the first thing to note is uh, we look at, uh, for those 34 years, the global count of exceedances that we get uh, as to the number of contiguous grid boxes that are exceeding the 95th percentile. And if you look at the histogram in blue, that's what comes from the analysis looking at the actual data. And if you look at the inset histogram in purple, that's what you get if you do a complete random sampling of those guys. So clearly there's quite a bit of spatial organization in each of the durations that we showed here. And the uh, tail proper, proper probabilities increase as the, the longer the, the duration that you look at. So here are some example time series associated with the number of contiguous pixels that were uh, exceeding the 95th percentile in each calendar year. So there's a bunch of time series uh, and they're segregated by all grades in the world, only the tropics, only the subtropics and only the extra tropics. And what you can see very quickly is that in each case, there are some years in which all metrics are highly elevated. And those typically happen to be years in which some kind of an El Nino activity perhaps was going on, but not, but not always. Sometimes uh, you have a suppression of those kind of activities as well. But uh, that's what we see there. And here's a visual that shows you for, uh, for example, for 2010, uh, what the picture looks like in terms of contiguous areas that uh, had an exceedance sometime during the year 2010. This is not all happening simultaneously. This is any time an event was exceeded, uh, what was the contiguous area? And then the lower picture shows you what it looks like for that same year on a 30-day event. And what you see is that typically when you look at contiguous areas, because I've highlighted some of those examples with circles, those areas are bigger for a 30-day event than when you are looking at the one-day event. And here's a zoom up of what happened in Sri Lanka that year. 
and in fact the colors turn redder if uh, the if the exceedance corresponds to a much higher return period event and so that's what we are seeing here basically the green is an exceedance of the 20 year event and the red color is an exceedance of a higher return period event than that so we were interested in is there organization in this as well so we did the same analysis the log of the number of contiguous uh, the log of the number of events versus the log of the number of uh, contiguous grids uh, that were seen as having an exceedance uh, for each one of those durations so the summary from this is that we again see scaling but in two ranges so if you look at uh, small areas, then the scaling exponents and the small areas here we are defining as 2,500 to 25,000 uh, square kilometers. Those decrease from, uh, those basically are at around a scaling exponent of 1.3, independent of the duration that we are looking at. Then when you go to the larger area, so this is 25,000 to 250,000 square kilometers. Here, the scaling exponent is around 2.5, decreasing slightly as you go towards per detail duration. So, so again, we see that there is substantial organization at different durations. Uh, and earlier, what we saw was scaling on durations as well. So it's interesting to see that uh, this complementarity is shown across these two. So this is example three at the global scale. And uh, so here, what we are looking at is basically a relationship between sea surface temperature and sea level pressure uh, at different lag times. So sea surface temperature today, looking at sea level pressure that fields that happen five days, 10 days, 15, 20, 25, 30 days into the future. And the reason for that is that we, as I said earlier, the sea surface temperatures change slowly. So they prescribe a boundary condition on the atmosphere. And what we are interested in is if there is organization in the sea surface temperature, then does that lead to resulting organization in the sea, sea level pressure fields, atmospheric pressure fields, which would then drive atmospheric water vapor transport to the locations we are interested in. So the way this analysis is done is using something called correlation networks. And so what that does is that, for example, if I'm looking five days ahead, it will correlate sea surface temperature at each location in the world to sea level pressure five days later at every location in the world. And if that correlation is significant, then it looks at all the spatial neighbors of the sea level pressure and all the spatial neighbors of the sea surface temperature at those locations. And if all of the, those guys are statistically significant, then it says, okay, this is a network and the flow of information is going from the sea surface temperature to the sea level pressure. And the correlations can be positive or they can be negative, i.e., it generates high pressure or it generates low pressure at the receiving location. And so the sign of the correlations is positive if the colors you're seeing are blue and it is negative if the colors you're seeing are, sorry, it's, it's positive if the colors are red and uh, negative if the colors are blue. So that is the diagnostic here that we have done. And you can see that most of the information comes from the equatorial and tropical belt and translates into the subtropics and uh, extratropics, which is expected because thermodynamically, the equator, equatorial regions end up being the heat engine of the planet. So then what we wanted to do was, can you actually do something with it? Can you predict extreme precipitation? So what we did was that we took the dipoles. So these are the dipoles are, for example, the, uh, the red and the blue, uh, since they are of opposite sign, we consider those guys to be a dipole. So we take those structures and only these nodes that are highlighted here in the network, and we do what's called a principal component analysis uh, and of, of all of those locations, uh, sea level pressure and sea surface temperature. And then we look at those principal components and do a correlation with extreme precipitation globally. So extreme here means that we have taken the, the uh, 95th percentile consistent with what we were doing before uh, for that particular location. So these correlations are shown here. And what you see is that these correlations are super high, especially in the tropics, but also 
in places, for example, where you guys are in BC for principal component number three there, uh, and we are comparing that on the right hand side in each of these figures with what you would get with what people do normally in the climate community, which is sea level pressure principal components directly, not looking at the channelization of the information. And similarly with sea surface temperature on the right hand side. So we take these few sea level pressure and sea surface temperature uh, principal components, and then we use them in a regression model for predicting uh, the future rainfall. So in this case, what we are doing is we are predicting rainfall that would occur 30 days forward from where you are today. And so the variables that show up as significant are, you can see only two or three here in most of these cases. So, it, so the interesting thing is after doing all that processing, we get very highly significant regressions predicting that there will be an extreme rainfall event in, at a regional scale in North Africa in December, January, February, in Central America in March, April, May, Central Africa in June, July, August, East Brazil in September, October, November. This is just an illustration. Different places in the world, we get different levels of scales in different seasons, as you might expect. But what's remarkable about this is that a global statistical model is able to give you this, the kind of precision that I'm showing you here with the p-values that we cannot get from a physics-based model. We get nothing beyond four to seven days globally or even regionally. So my point with that is that there seems to be an indication that there is an organization at global scale that we are not successfully tapping in our physics-based models and that there is predictability that might be useful there. So let's move to continental scales to try to see what happens over North America. And I'm going to look at floods and I'm going to look at three examples here also. So let's get into them. So here's something that was done by a high school girl who was trying for the Intel Science Cell Talent Competition and came and talked to me in the year 2000. And uh, she actually placed second overall in the country. And this is a very simple analysis. Uh, for each of these Western states, Washington, Oregon, Northern California, Central California, and Southern California, she took the data from every river gauge uh, where there were flows for 60 years or more. Um, and she identified the 10 largest floods uh, in each of those states from each of those uh, locations. Uh, so for example, in the state of Washington, she ended up with something like 38 river gauges so she has 38 river gauges at each of which she has she has identified the uh, 10 largest floods and the 10 smallest floods in the historical record in 60 years. Then she adds all of these up and for each of the years in which um, you have the maximum number of these 10 year events or the 10 largest regional floods aggregating over all of those or 10 smallest ones, I simply asked her to plot the average of the sea surface temperature and other fields associated with those calendar years. So for example, uh, this one on the left for Washington is 1996, 1976, 1956, 1991, and 1951. And each of these pictures has a different set of years in which that was the case. So the thing to look at here is, this is sea surface temperature, and this is the 10 largest floods, and then dramatically, a diagonally opposite to that is in the bottom is Southern California, 10 smallest floods. Take a look at those two sea surface temperature pictures and you'll see a similarity. Then if you look at the 10 smallest floods for Washington, which is the top right, and diagonally come across to Southern California, um, for the 10 largest floods, you'll see that there's a certain similarity in the sea surface temperature pattern there. And then if you look at the states in between, they are transitioning across there. So the joke here statement we made was that as the sea surface temperature at the equator walks from the Western Pacific to the Eastern Pacific, we get the floods walk from Washington to Southern California. So this was very interesting and she did obviously more than this, but this is telling. And then to look at whether physically all this makes sense, this is an illustration for Oregon. So we start with sea surface temperature, we look at outgoing long wave radiation, which is associated with convection or the suppression of convection if there's a lot of uh, outgoing longer radiation. And then we look at sea level pressure and winds. And then we look at how the winds have changed. So this is a consistent story that works all the way through. 
if you come right down to the bottom for the 10 largest floods, what you see is that the wind anomaly is coming through, intensifying and coming right into Oregon. The arrows are big and the, the wind speed is indicated by the orange color, which is a uh, higher wind speed. Whereas in the smallest floods case, the winds are basically blocked. They don't come into Oregon, they go over the north. So physically, this entire story was consistent. And so that was a very nice discovery. Obviously, we should have published this, but I just enjoy showing this kind of result out because it's fun. So there was a postdoc around at that time who's now a professor in Korea called Hyun Han Kwan. So what he did is that we, he took that uh, same idea and he's repeated that for different locations in the US. The plotting is a little bit off these uh, blue dots are river gauge locations and it looks like they're in the ocean. So there was a little bit of a problem plotting. But what he did is he went back into the climate model, which is integrated daily with real observation. And he introduces tracers into it and follows moisture transport. So the, the blackish colors are the amount of moisture and the arrows represent the winds uh, identified using a Lagrangian particle tracing model in this. So the uh, so what is done is that for all those locations, you identify the, ten year, the, the years in which the 10-year flood was exceeded. For each of the actual events, you then go to the climate model, you pick off the wind fields, and then you start averaging them over. So in this picture, there may be around 20 sites. So imagine that at 20 sites, you have uh, 10 largest floods that have happened historically. So there's 200 different events, potentially. And we are averaging the climate over all those 200 events. If these were random, things should just cancel out. You should see absolutely nothing interesting. So this is on the East Coast. We can see there's a very coherent, strong flow on average associated with these flood events. And of course, there's something going on in the Pacific at the same time uh, that is going on with this. So now let's look at the West Coast. You can see very coherent behavior for uh, example for Oregon, which is what we talked about before. This is now the southeastern US. This is coming into the upper Midwest. This is coming back into the East Coast. Uh, this is a few sites uh, in the upper Midwest slightly different. These are all different seasons as well. So the point is that if I look at the top 10 floods regionally across the US, there is a very strong, very large scale phenomena that drives them. It's not local convection. Unfortunately, when I was a graduate student, I was taught these are all mesoscale convective complexes randomly generated locally. That's not what the game is. So uh, fast forward a few years, and this is Catherine Schleff, who was a postdoc here a couple of years ago. She's started using uh, the same idea and she looks at the flood of record, the worst flood that ever happened at each of these gauges that you're seeing on the left, as well as any event that exceeded the 10 year return period at each one. And she wants to do now using neural networks and automatic classification of the atmospheric circulation patterns associated with floods at every one of these gauges across the United States. And the clustering variables she looks at are specific humidity, how much water is in the atmosphere, Omega, which is what's the strength of the local convection or vertical uh, uh, air movement, uh, and then the zonal and meridional uh, wind and the surface temperature. And she looks at two days before the flood, looking at it as a precursor. So there are three zones that she does the analysis on. The black dots are the one zone, the purple, and then the east in the blue. So examples of that to show you are, uh, this is out uh, in the west. Uh, and uh, these guys all got classified with uh, a Central Pacific tropical moisture export. So this is like the atmospheric river story, just like what happened in California a couple of days ago. And you, perhaps you guys got to see some remnants of it. So there's the flow that is associated with this. And in the graphic here, she shows the calendar months in which this is typically active and the percentage of the record floods at uh, the percentage of the peak over threshold floods that were associated with this mechanism. In the East Coast, uh, the mechanism that she's highlighting here is hurricanes and the fraction of floods uh, that are caused by that particular mechanism. Summarizing that, this is uh, her quantitatively abstracted uh, dominant atmospheric mechanism by region. And by the way, almost all the cases that we are looking at here 
uh, are correspond with large scale flows of moisture coming in from the Gulf of Mexico or from the Western Pacific or from the Northern Atlantic. That's basically it for the story. There's very few events which are generated by uh, other cases. The snowmelt, snowmelt spring storms are some, and then some in the Midwest, like uh, uh, in, in, in the region out here, which is blank, are coming from those other kinds of events. Okay, so let's move to regional scales as my last sort of uh, thing, because I know I'm going to exhaust the time window here. Uh, so the question I ask now is, okay, it seems like there's organization in these things at the continental scale. Can we do something with this about local or regional prediction? So the hint is yes, of course. And uh, what we wanna see is, what do we understand once one zooms in about the nature of the event and what is going on? So I'm going to go through three examples here also. Uh, so we look at one event uh, in the Ohio River Basin and the highlight here is uh, to debunk the idea that soil moisture has a big role to play. Uh, debunking it in the sense that what we see is that we get waves of tropical moisture export every four to seven days coming into the region. And that trajectory of moisture coming in is what determines the soil moisture. So uh, soil moisture doesn't just magically come from anywhere. And so the organization, large scale organization of the flows is what generates that. The second one is looking at something in France. And here we want to see if we can build a simple model which allows us to predict extreme rainfall events once we have diagnosed what goes on. And the third one is an interesting one from Germany and let's get to these things. So the first one, we are looking in the Ohio River Basin and on the next slide, you'll see the map as to where that is. And we do the same kind of game that we've been doing all along. We identify uh, over about uh, 11 gauges uh, any flood that happened, which was bigger than the 10 year flood at that gauge. And then regionally, these are the total number of uh, such floods that happened in each of the years. So 2011, which is in the light blue, was a big, or 2010 was a big year. And then the others, you can see that there's you know, some stuff going on. So there's a total of 23 events here. And what I'm going to do is show you what happens when we average over all these 23 events in different attributes. So here's what happens. So first look in the bottom two pictures. And what's shown there is the, the, the purple dots that you see are the location of those 11 gauges. And then the arrows are the wind transport associated with the moisture. And uh, the moisture itself is shown uh, in the red, yellow, green sort of contours that are out there. Uh, the full moisture transport field and the full wind field is shown in the bottom left. And it's departure from what would happen on average on the calendar day of those events is what's shown on the right. So the bottom picture is for the event in 2011. And the, all the analysis we did was using the data up to 2010. So the 2011 event is not included in the analysis that is shown on the top. That's the average over those 23 events. And what you should be, should be impressed by is that the average of 23 events that hit that particular region is remarkably similar to the one event in 2011 that was not used in there, okay? Uh, so the question is, how does this guy look once you look in time? So to do that, what we have done here is day zero on the right bottom is the day on which the peak flood happened. And we calculate the moisture transport that came into that region and how much moisture was dumped by the storm tracks on each day working backwards from the day of the peak flood. So the day of the peak flood is right here. And, uh, the, uh, and the red curve here is for the 2011 event, which was not included in the data. The, all the other events averaged together are the black curve, the dashed black curve is the median, and then the gray curve is the spread across those uh, 23 um, events that we were talking about. And first takeaway is that if you look at this, we had a, we are going back 60 days. We have a rainfall event, then we have a pause, rainfall event, we have a pause, we have a rainfall event, a pause, et cetera, et cetera. So this, could this is just random junk as far as I'm concerned uh, when we are looking at the red thing. But what's interesting is that that kind of behavior is repeated in the average of those 23 events also. So if you go and actually look at the atmospheric circulation patterns, 
you can see these waves coming every four to seven days. And, and the organizing principle here is that we have taken the day of the peak flood and we have set that to zero and we are counting time backwards from there. And so those waves, some of those waves cancel out because you know it's not an exact period, it's between four to seven days is the time scale associated with the synoptic waves, which is what this respect. So some, some of those cancel out, but even in the uncertainty distribution, you can see that the wave structure is retained. So that's essentially the diagnosis here is that if you are concerned about soil moisture plus event rainfall, the soil moisture really is generated by the Gulf of Mexico in this particular example in waves that energize in the Gulf of Mexico and then move into this particular region. Okay, example two. So this is uh, the largest event that had happened in France and Germany until one this year, which was uh, equally spectacular. And we haven't analyzed that one yet. So here's now uh, particle tracking to show you exactly what is going on. So the event happens at the bottom right. And here we are looking at tracks uh, which are generated by particles that are seeded globally. And then we retain those particles uh, where they cohesively flow into France. So particles are, are, are introduced everywhere on the planet uniformly. And then we basically uh, do, do particle tracking forwards. Or in some cases, we have done reverse particle tracking to go back and find where the moisture has come from. So you can see that on 11th of January, 1995, which is the top left, this system was organized. And there is some rain happening in the US. And then this translates over. and. Uh, the amount of moisture uh, reaching France is actually not that substantial. Move to the right and you see how this, uh, this particular system is still organized in the same way. Keep moving to the right and you can see that it's still organized in the same way. Now go to the second row and you can see that the, the rainfall in the US is intensifying. And then this goes on and goes through. Then the system has broken down. So it's just raining a bit over the ocean, but it has dissipated. Now it re-energizes and we are starting to have a track that is going directly over the Atlantic and a separate system that is sending something and then joining up back here. You can see that these merge together in the next row. And then ultimately most of the storm is concentrating back over here and is ending up with a substantial rainfall over France. So it's kind of interesting to understand how organized this feature is in terms of uh, how this goes on. So what we did was similar analysis to what you saw in the previous one. We look at the number of tracks that enter the area in France and the total amount of specific humidity release. And so uh, you can see that that's, that's a proxy for basically the rainfall that has happened. So it's a similar sort of thing to what we were seeing before, except this guy visited things in between. So what we did is that we looked at the northern uh, extra tropics where the jet stream dynamics basically organizes these kind of flows. So this is 40 north to 60 north across the whole planet. And we do a principal component analysis of sea level pressures, uh, atmospheric pressure fields. And then we correlate them with rainfall in France. And the ones that seem to be important are the features that are shown here. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six that uh, are of decreasing importance uh, as the patterns that drive what goes on. So then we use these uh, six patterns to try to predict what would be the rainfall in 1995 without ever using any of the data from 1995 to fit our model. Uh, only the data up to 1994 to be precise. So the, the, the rainfall data is in the blue dots and the forecast and the uncertainty bands associated with that are in the red lines. And you can see that we don't do too badly for when the major rainfall event happens. The more, the greater the organization, the greater the predictability, and that happens when the rainfall goes up, not for the smaller events. So that's the take home message from this one. Last example, very quickly, what is done for Germany, and this actually combines a lot of different ideas, but the idea was we are interested in high stream flow events over all of Ger Germany, defined as anything in excess of the 90, 90th or 95th percentile of flow. We want to link that to integrated vapor transport in the moisture, integrated in the sense that it's from the surface to 500 millibar heights. And then we want to see how that vapor transport is related to circulation pattern. 
This goes back to my idea that I mentioned in the beginning that water is the tracer in the atmospheric system. So the water transport reflects the nature of the organization of the circulation patterns. But we want to do this in a way such that the high stream flow events are related to the vapor transport and the circulation patterns with an appropriate amount of lead time. So if the circulation pattern is organized on January the 11th and the rainfall is then going to happen on the 17th of January, that's, I, I need to know that lead, lead time uh, as, that is associated with this system and then I want to use that for prediction. So I won't talk about all the machinery because that would have taken up all this talk. But what we get out of this analysis is that Germany can be partitioned into four clusters, purple, orange, light blue, and these green stations geographically. And uh, then we look at whether we can predict whether or not high stream flow events happen there, and what is the nature of the integrated vapor transport associated with these trays. So on the right, what you're seeing is the vapor transport averaged as estimated for the Northwest cluster, the purple guys on the left-hand side. This is what happens there. Then if you want to look at the Southwest cluster, which is uh, the green guys here, then uh, it's shown as a difference from the pattern associated with the Northwest cluster. So there's a basic shift down into that particular side. So that's the diagnostic that we have to see. And then what we do is we predict the probability that you will have a high stream flow event uh, n days later in the northwestern cluster or northeastern cluster, et cetera, uh, conditional on the integrated vapor transport that we see n days before. And the prediction of that probability and its uncertainty bands are shown here. And uh, we have validated this also on out of, this is basically out of sample validation on those as well. So the point is that you know, we have reached a point where using machine learning tools and physics intuition we can put those things together and identify what can happen and what we can do with it. Uh, what remains is to understand what we have to improve in the physics and the models to generate these behaviors in free running models. We don't get that. Uh, when we have models like in reanalysis that are constrained by data every single day and they don't drift off from that, we can diagnose such relationships. But when we run these models forward, as in climate change simulations or, or as in decadal simulations, most of the time we do not get the organization happening in the right place or in, in the right kind of way. And uh, we can discuss that at length as to in the, in the discussion period if you'd like. Okay, so I'm closing. So here's our friend, the canine hydrologist. What do you think he's doing? Any thoughts? I'll let you think about it. What I'll say is, since there's no dialogue possible here that easily, is our friend here is thinking about being outside the box. He's not thinking outside the box. That would be revolutionary. But he's thinking about what is outside the box. That's the first step. And as hydrologists, we need to start thinking about what is outside our box uh, and how relevant it is to what we are in the box. Uh, he's got the bone in there. So that's good, right? But there's more to life than chewing the bone, as my dog will tell you. Okay, so closing remarks. Well, it was all about emergent patterns. But when I give this kind of a talk, the physics based crowd says, Oh, why bother? You know, you're just telling us about history. The climate is changing, or the climate has actually already changed. So everything you're talking about is not good in the future. In fact, in my class, uh, I send them a 120 year time series of rainfall as a homework problem. And this kid said, I'm only going to use the last 20 years because the climate has changed. The previous 100 years are useless. And another kid jumps up and says, oh, no, no, just, you know, we should just use the last three years because anything beyond that is completely useless. And I'm thinking, my gosh, I have my work cut out for me here. But, uh, you know, it's not about climate change. It's really about understanding what the hell is going on. And unless you look at data and compare that with what is happening in your models, you don't get it. So that's what it is. And uh, here is a character who impressed me when I first came to the United States and would sit in a common room, watch TV. So he's my hero. Okay, that's it, guys. <laughs> 
<laughs> I got that last reference because uh, we're maybe of a similar generation. That, right. That's great. Whether whether our uh, current graduate students will know Colonel Clink, I don't know. I but don't know. Great. <laughs> yeah. So Manu, thanks so much. That was a very lively and entertaining summary and, and uh, quite thought provoking as well. We're almost out of time, but uh, I, I do want to open up for questions in the few minutes remaining till the top of the hour. Uh, so please just uh, unmute, uh, chime in, type into the chat if you like. We've got a few minutes for questions. Uh, and maybe I'll just mention briefly, Manu, that I was on a, a Torino uh, board of directors call yesterday and, you know, Torino is this amazing network, as you may know, in Germany for gauging catchments around the country. And they've looked at that most recent floods from the summer in one of their heavily instrumented catchments that happened to be right in the epicenter of it all, the Wustelbach catchment. And fully half of the flood peak was made up of water stored in the basin, basin before the rain started falling. So you think of, uh, think of, uh, I don't know, the physics of it all, uh, I guess not only is uh, water the, the tracer, uh, but also, uh, oops, have I lost you there? No, I'm here. Okay, sorry, something was flashing on my screen. Uh, the, the physics of how the watershed then processes that right. uh, very rare rainfall event is also uh, subject to a lot of discussion. Absolutely. Uh, Jim Kirster had a, had a paper, uh, I don't know, 2006. It's not that we don't want our models to be physics-based. We just don't know what physics to use. Yeah. And, uh, th th I think that's a stunning example. But anyway, I, I don't want to dominate. I want to hopefully uh, encourage any to chime in with a question or a comment. I see some of our modelers there, like uh, Kevin Shook, others. Uh, here's one from uh, Zen Hua Li. Thank you for a nice talk. Is that Some of the dipole activity that you were seeing there at that time scale is exactly related to the Madden Julian oscillation. And, uh, you know, the thing is that the, there are several indices people have cooked up for the Madden Julian oscillation. And we didn't want to use them, we wanted to actually understand what the connectivity was and uh, how it evolved over time and see. Great. Time for one last quick question at one minute to the hour. Uh, I've, I found your uh, Oregon example very interesting because when I was at Oregon State, uh, the idea always was the recipe for the biggest floods was rain on snow. And then looking at your distribution of months from that analysis, it was well, overlapping that rain on snow period, right? The December, yeah. February, February, I think it was. Yeah. Good. Well, Manu, we're, we're at the top of the hour. And the plan now is uh, uh, one of our new postdocs, Magali Nehemi, who might uh, show her face here shortly on video, is going to chair the next uh, 15, 30 minutes of early career discussion with other uh, early career folks that might stay on the call. Okay. I need to run to another meeting, but I'm going to leave you in Magali's uh, capable hands. And uh, I think she's now co-host for the meeting. So if I if I jump out of this, it won't affect things. You're probably co-host as well. But on behalf of all of us, Manu, thanks for a really uh, stimulating talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I, I think our early career folks will really enjoy getting your perspective uh, from your wide range of background wide-ranging background on, uh, uh, you know, navigating and launching an, an academic career. 